Originally, I was going to do this video yesterday, but since I got back home very late yesterday and that I actually went straight to bed as I got home, uh, that's why I delayed this video to today and that, you know, I know this is a little bit late to do a review on a Tuesday and I hope I don't have to do this more often in in the future but unfortunately this week since i went down to la and since when i came back i was thinking about doing the review for the saturday game but then i realized that i basically just hit hit a wall when i went back home and that you yeah, just gotta remember i did drove 770 miles round trip which was probably one of the craziest day road trip i have ever attended and in some way i don't know if it was really worth it Mainly because of how the resort of that game went, which I, of course, will talk a little bit later in this video once I get to this game. But the first game that we're going to be talking about is Columbus and NYCFC. So, the crew, they got a 1-0 win against NYCFC, but in many ways, it should have been more than 1-0. Uh, second minute in the game, Chanel sees red for denial of goal scored opportunity. I believe that is the fastest red card ever produced on on opening weekend and one of the fastest in MLS history and to me when I look on the replay I feel like in some way it's a little bit harsh mainly because you usually don't see red car happen that very early and especially when you know there was definitely contact but Zeller Ryan kind of draw draw that a little bit and kind of tripped himself a little bit to make it more dramatic than it is but still you know Chanel that he did make some contact to Zeller Ryan and since Chanel when he made that tackle and he was the last man there was really no choice but him getting sent off in that game so NYCFC was down to 10 men for the rest of the game and pretty much for the rest of the game Columbus absolutely dominate the possession and chances um you know as I mentioned they dominate the match with a bunch of chances but they couldn't put those chances away because of lack of finishing now in the second half once again they had a lot of chances but they finally found the back of the net and it happened in the 57th minute and it's their record signing Zellerin scores to give Columbus a 1-0 lead absolute golazo from Zellerin the fact that he was able to hit that to the top left corner of the post and as I said Columbus of course had a 1-0 lead but they continued to have chances in the second half uh, one of those chances was Diaz, unfortunately, hitting the post in the 60th minute. Then Diaz, 13 minutes later, somehow missed from four yards out. And if you watch the replay of this, yeah, this was one of the worst misses I have seen from this weekend. Like, he was literally wide open in the box. And yet, somehow, not only the fact that he didn't even hit the target, but he completely whiffed that one, like, about 20 y yards wide off the post. I mean, that is just some some horrendous finishing and then in some way that finishing kind of summarized columbus day in terms of in front of goal because they were very poor in terms of in front of goal and then in the 80th minute pedro santos got denied by sean johnson uh santos is another guy that probably could have had a goal or two in this game but unfortunately due to the lack of finishing and also sean johnson trying his best to pretty much do it on his heads to keep this game at one nothing uh, Columbus wasn't able to get more goals than the one that they got. And in terms of the shots in this game, they had 14 shots compared to 7 that NYCFC had. 6 shots on goal compared to 3 that NYCFC had. 4 shots off target compared to none that NYCFC had. Both teams had 4 shots that was blocked. And possession-wise, 62% possession compared to 38% possession that NYCFC had. And, you know, for Columbus, you know, they'll be a little disappointed the fact that they didn't score more goals in this game and that the finishing was a big problem in this, but at the end of the day, three points is three points, and I think they're going to be happy walking out of this game with a win. And as for NYCFC, I'm not going to really judge the fact that this was kind of a bad performance because anytime when you get sent off that early and you have to play pretty much the entire match down to 10 men, it is always going to be very hard to tr try to get something out of it. And they did try their best to ho hold it, hold this hold Columbus to to a one nothing lead for a while and also hold them scoreless for a while but unfortunately they just couldn't quite do that uh but moving on into the next match is the other New York team so the other New York team unlike NYCFC actually got a victory which 
shouldn't be a surprise because the other New York team had a more easier matchup in in their fixture compared to NYCFC when they had to go on the road to Columbus. Whereas the Red Bulls, they had to play against FC Cincinnati. And if you're FC Cincinnati, I mean, I guess there's some, some encouragement, the fact that they did try to fight back multiple times. But yeah, the defense, it is still horrendous after this game. Now, one of the things that realized before we start this game is that there was a lot of empty seats at this game probably you know throughout the whole week i think the most empty seats i see at a season opener came in this red bulls versus fc cincinnati game i mean not only the fact that upper deck was tarp off but also the lower section there wasn't really a lot lot of people there and there was just a bunch of empty seats and again i i just don't understand why in the world the red bulls doesn't have more people watching them, especially as a team that, you know, I know this season they're kind of going through a bit of a transition and they're playing against FC Cincinnati, which is not the most appeal kind of opponent. But you would think for a season opener, th there would be more people watching this game and that there shouldn't be as much empty seats as I saw at Red Bull Arena. Uh, the other thing I also noticed is the Red Bull's goalkeeper, Janssen, he actually wear a baseball cap. And for the record, it is technically legal to wear a baseball cap during a day game uh not a lot of goalkeeper in mls do it even though i think back in the 80s and the 90s a lot of goalkeeper used to always wear baseball cap during the daytime because it can help them in terms of shooting thing uh when they're they're trying to see see the ball coming in and that they have to battle the sun to trying to see see the ball coming into their area they can the baseball cap will definitely help to try to shield a bit of that sun. And there's nothing in the rule books that says you can't wear a baseball cap if you're a goalkeeper or even an outfield player. So, yeah. Well, for outfield player, it wouldn't make sense to wear a baseball cap because you still have to head in the ball. And I don't think wearing a baseball cap would be a great a great idea if you're trying to head it the ball. So, that was kind of a little bit unique, the fact that he decided to wear a baseball cap which is something that I thought a lot of people thought that that was not 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 something that you could do but it's theoretically legal it's just that you don't see it very often with goalkeepers nowadays now in the first half the Red Bulls they completely dominated and their dominance finally was rewarded with a goal in the 16th minute when Kyle Duncan scores from Florian Valet and Daniel Royer it's great to see that Valet was on the score sheet in fact he was on on the score sh sheet twice in this game well not really in the score sheet but more like in the assist sheet because you know this is the first time he came back from that tor torn ACL that he suffered last year and the fact that his first game back from that devastating injury and he provided two assists just shows you how how decent he is and what a fight back it is for this guy that had to deal with such a devastating injury that he suffered last season now, Royer almost doubled the lead 20 seconds after the the goal was scored by Kyle Duncan. But eventually, the Red Bulls did double their lead. And it would be Kaku from Valet again and Duncan to make it 2-0 in favor of the Red Bulls. And yeah, the Red Bulls was just all over FC Cincinnati in the first half. This could have been really ugly if the Red Bulls would have, would have maybe shown a little bit more of the clinical finish. I mean, I know they did put two goals into the back of the net, but they could have easily put four or five if they were being a little bit more clinical in this game. Now, in the second half, um, FC Cincinnati scored. Uh, Cruz scored from Vasquez and Garza to make it 2-1, and that really kind of shocked a lot of people because the Red Bulls, they were controlling the first half, and basically they just fell, fell asleep just one minute into the second half, and it's almost as if they weren't really prepared to to come out in the second half and carry that momentum that they had in the first half to the second half. However, they eventually kind of did do that, and that in some way that was kind of like a warning that, you know, yes, the Red Bulls was kind of cruising, but you got to also realize you can't just switch off like they did in the beginning part of the second half. Um, and eventually they did get... Get that two-goal lead back in the 69th minute when Daniel Royer scores from Kyle Duncan to make it 3-1 in favor of the Red Bulls. Uh, Duncan is another guy that had a very decent day with one goal and two assists in this game. Uh, but FC Cincinnati didn't give up 
and then in the 82nd minute, Jurgen Lekadia scored his first ever goal for FC Cincinnati, and you know, part of that has to do with the fact that there was some very bad defending from the Red Bulls, and that they just gave the ball away in the midfield and allowed Lacadia to just win, go through on goal, and that Lacadia showing his clinical finishing and putting that one into the back of the net to to give FC Cincinnati life. But fortunately, that is as close as FC Cincinnati gets, as they couldn't quite come back all the way to salvage a draw in this game. And in terms of shots in this game, 15 shots compared to 11 that Cincinnati has. 6 shots on goal compared to 5 that FC Cincinnati has. 6 shots off target compared to 5 that FC Cincinnati has. 3 shots that was blocked compared to 1 that FC Cincinnati has. And possession wise, 44% possession compared to 57% possession that FC Cincinnati has. And you know, for the Red Bulls, it was a pretty comfortable win even though it was only like a 1 goal, goal win that they had. And as for FC Cincinnati, you know... Yes, they did show some fight back, as I said, but that defense still needs to be fixed big time because if that is going to be that defense that is going to look for, for out this season, don't be surprised if they're going to concede around 75 goals again like they did last season. Uh, but moving on into the next match is the Sounders. So this was not a pretty win for the Sounders against the Chicago Fire, but still, they did get... A win and they did did redeem themselves a little bit after that embarrassing loss against Olympia in CONCACAF Champions League back on Thursday. Um, in the first half, Leardon almost give the Sounders their first goal of the season, but fortunately he didn't he wasn't able to put it on target. Uh, the Sounders squander a lot of chances early on and they could have easily went up one nothing in this game. And then in the 35th minute, it looked like Chicago just completely flip the script and score against the run of play when Mihalovic actually scored the goal. But unfortunately, the offside flag went straight up as soon as he he was able to put that one into the back of the net. So the game stays at, at nil nil heading into halftime. Second half, uh, Morris subbed in at halftime and at the post game game, Morris actually said that he was not happy, the fact that he was a substitute in this game and that he didn't start in this one, and I don't blame him because I feel like he should be a guy that should be a regular starter with this team, and it was kind of interesting to see why Brian Schmidt decided to sub him off at halftime, but whatever anger that he, he had coming into this match, boy did he bring it into this one, and he would be a big difference maker for Seattle in this game. Uh, but before that, in the 46th minute, Barrich would score his first goal from Mihailovic and Merdran to give Chicago a surprising 1-0 lead. Then Rodon looked like he scored the equalizer for the Sounders, but unfortunately it was questionably rule offside. And I should have put questionably with a quotation mark because I don't think that was offside. Like, they gone to VAR, um, they, I even look at it a couple of times, and I, I just don't see how in the world... That is offside. Like even the ESPN broadcaster says that they were kind of surprised the fact that it was offside. So, you know, until if I if I get a more clarification of why that is offside, and probably when I watch the instant replay video on on the MLS YouTube channel, I will understand why exactly that was offside. Because from multiple looks that I saw on this replay, I didn't think this was an offside goal from Rodan. Uh, but Seattle did get the equalizer in the 62nd minute, and as I said, Jordan Morris, he was very angry coming into this game after the fact that he, he was only being subbed in in this game instead of starting, and he basically started the, the Sounders comeback when he scored from Rodan and Leardown to tie the game up at one apiece. Then the 71st minute, Rui Diaz sh clearly should have given the Sounders a 2-1 lead. I mean, I wrote he missed... A tap in there like the fact that y you see nine out of ten time when Rui Diaz is a able to get into a good spot and tap the ball into the back of the net nine out of ten times he's gonna bury that and yet that was just one of those ten times that he couldn't bury it and that the Sounders could have easily got a 2-1 lead there and as we were winding down this game it looks like Chicago was gonna earn a very gritty point but there was Morris again who who started the comeback for Seattle would finish the comeback when he scored from Rodan and pa Paulo to 
give Seattle a 2-1 lead. Good to see Joe Paulo being on the score sheet there and getting an assist on his debut view in MLS for the Seattle Sounders. And yeah, the Sounders with a 2-1 win and a come-from-behind win against the Chicago Fire. And in terms of shots in this game, 16 shots compared to 12 that Chicago has. 6 shots on goal compared to 3 that the Fire has. 8 shots off target compared to 6 that the Fire has. 2 shots that was blocked compared to 3 that the Fire has. Possession-wise, 54% possession compared to 46% possession that the Chicago Fire has. So, yeah, for the Sounders, it was not a pretty resort, but they got it done in the end. And as for the Fire, you know, it's kind of a, a little bit disappointed that they didn't get anything out of it. And I feel like with the way that they play in this game, although they didn't look dominant in this game, they put in a very gritty road performance that most of the time you would think that, that with that kind of performance, a road team would get a point out of that but just wasn't meant to be for Chicago and now they're gonna have to move on into their next game which is another road game that they have to do uh, but moving on into the next match is the game that I attended which is LAFC versus Miami so yeah as I mentioned in the beginning of the video you know I made a 700 50 mile round trip drive to go to LA to watch this game and I was actually very excited about this game mainly because not only I I was excited to see an LAFC season opener but I also want to see some history from Inter Miami the fact that they could potentially score their first ever goal in MLS and maybe even become one of the rarest expansion team to able to grab victory victory in their first game in MLS history but unfortunately both of those things didn't happen. Although, I will say this. The atmosphere definitely kind of made up for it. I mean, you know, if you want to go to an MLS game and if you want to experience some of the best atmosphere an MLS game will always provide you, then you have to go to Bank of California Stadium because the free 2 5 2, they clearly bring, bring it in this game. And although I did really like the traveling support from Inter Miami, they were also making some noises, even though. I couldn't really quite hear it because I was sitting closer to the 3252 than the traveling support. But I did kind of just went there during the pregame when they were banging the drum and they were as loud as what the 3252 was. And it seemed like they were very passionate about this team. So I can't wait to see how, how their season opener is going to be and how their supporter is going to be look like when they have their season opener in a couple of weeks against the Galaxy. But in the first half, just like Nashville, I thought Inter Miami looked very shaky early. But unlike Nashville, they weren't they didn't concede an early goal from LAFC. Although they could have easily done it in the sixth minute when Diego Rossi had a free header in the box and somehow, in some way, Robles absolutely robbed him with just an incredible save. And that, you know, if I if there is gonna be an award for save of the week, which I believe there is. This one has to be the save of the week because the way that Robles was, was able to stretch with his quick reflex to stretch full string to try trying to palm that that header that Rossi put put is just absolutely amazing. And this just shows you why exactly Inter Miami picked him up and why I was kind of puzzling why the Red Bulls decided to let Robles go doing this offseason. Now, in the 8th minute, it looked like LFC got the opening goal when Mark Anthony K scores, but unfortunately, the flag went up, and it wouldn't be the first time that LAFC in this game would be denied of a goal because of an offside. Now, after that shaky start from Inter Miami, they started to generate some momentum and started to create some of their own chances too. I mean, you know, there was part of this game where... I thought Inter Miami were kind of the better team and that they really took it to LAFC and that really I feel like for Inter Miami the only reason why they didn't score in this game is that they just don't have a goal score on this team. They they're basically kind of having the same issue that Nashville has except unlike Nashville I think if they do get that goal scored this team would be a very dangerous team because I really love the midfield and the defensive effort that they put in. They definitely have some creative player like Pizarro who doing this game I thought he had a very de decent one but the missing link in this game is that they just don't have a finisher in this game and obviously Carenza was supposed to be the finisher for this for this team but unfortunately he is out with an injury and he's not going to be back with this Miami team until probably two months into the at least two months into the season now 
just as Miami thought that they were going to head to halftime 0-0, which I think they will be ha happy that they will be heading into halftime scoreless. Vela scores in the 44th minute, and I also wrote go of the week question mark because, yeah, this was just absolutely filthy. And I, I don't, you know, sometimes I know Vela is a MVP caliber of a player, and I know he he's always do this kind of of stuff throughout his last season but seriously Vela you have to do it against a team that's playing their first ever competitive game in history I mean come on can you just at least give them a break and just you know not not create your some crazy magical moment that you always tend to do right when you're playing against a team that clearly needs needs to to be respective and that they're just playing their first game and they're just getting their feet into the water in in their in their inaugural MLS season. Now in the second half, LAFC once again scored what looked like the second goal of this game, but once again it was disallowed for offside. And I believe this time was Brian Rodriguez the one that was unfortunately denied of the goal because he was in an offside position. Uh, both teams created some chances but couldn't finish. I mean for the rest of the game, both teams had some decent chances of their own, but unfortunately none. There, there wasn't really any goal goals that was happening for the rest of the game and that the finishing wasn't that good from both of these teams. And that's how we finish as LAFC walk out with a 1-0 win against Miami. Uh, shots in this game, LAFC had 21 shots compared to 15 that Miami has. 9 shots on goal compared to 7 that Miami has. 3 shots off target compared to 4 that Miami has. 9 shots off block compared to 4 that Inter-Miami has. And LAFC dominate the possession at 60% compared to 40% that Inter Miami has. And you know, for LAFC, this was definitely not a vintage performance. But hey, sometimes when you have an ugly game like this and you're able to get free points, that just shows that you are definitely a a contender of potentially going all the way to MLS Cup and winning the competition. And as for Inter Miami, I mean, there's really no shame of able to. To only lose one nothing against the defending supporter shield champ, and in many ways, I thought Miami. If you want to compare both of the expansion team and how they did in their their inaugural game, I would say Miami was even more impressive. I mean, you know, that's not take anything away with the fact that Nashville did really decent in their game too. But keep in mind, Nashville was also playing an Atlanta team that was kind of injury riddle and that. There was also part of the game they didn't have their most lethal goal scored in Joseph Martinez. Inter Miami, you know, they really pushed that back line of LAFC. And that I really think, as I said before, if they have a goal scored on this team, this team could have won that game. This team could have easily walked out all three points and had LAFC only their third regular se season loss in their franchise history. And I'm not even exaggerating that. That's how good in terms of their midfield and defense is. The only thing that they're missing is that they just need a striker or a player that can put the final product in for this team. But that being said, I am now going to be switching the boards and look at the last game of this weekend, which is Portland versus Minnesota. You know, when I made that prediction of the Western Conference just last week where I put Minnesota in third place, I said it was a bold prediction, but I didn't say the fact that I was just being super optimistic about this Minnesota team. And I feel like some people would have also said that because maybe I'm just showing my bias, putting one of my favorite team that high in the table. And that fact that it's going to take a lot to try to, for Minnesota to replicate what they did last season into this season. And they need to do it even one better heading into this season. Well, after this performance against the Portland Timbers, and if this is going to be something that we're going to see a lot from Minnesota this season... Not only the fact that they, they could not make that bold prediction that I made true, but this could really be an MLS Cup contender team. And I know I'm kind of getting a little bit overexcited with this role victory, but what I saw in this game is something that I definitely haven't seen Minnesota done in, a, in their first two years of existence, and that... I really hope that this is going to be something we're going to see heading this year and that if this is going to be the product that, that Minnesota is going to produce, this could be a very good year for this team. Now, in the first half, Portland had a bunch of chances, but they couldn't 
find their clinical finishing. And I thought Minnesota didn't really have a great start to this game. I mean, they were defending a lot. In this game and they only had like two shots in the first 40 minutes I guess maybe Adrian Heath was trying to give Portland their tapes of their own medicine by trying to sit deep and trying to go on the break and try to may maybe catch Portland off guard at the back in terms of the counter-attack but it didn't really quite work in the first half and that they didn't really create a lot of chance out of that however in the second half that was a different story because in the second half not only the fact that they were once again defending very well, but they finally able to get get behind this Timbers team on the counter attack, and this Timbers team had a lot of trouble dealing with the counter attack that the the, the Loons put in the second half. Um, in the 51st minute, they go up one nothing when Kevin Molino scores, none other than on a a counter attack to give give Minnesota a one nothing lead. But unfortunately, that lead didn't last very long because Valeri would score on the penalty after Ico Parra unfortunately commits a foul in the box and give away a penalty to the Timbers. Uh, the Timbers was pushing for the second goal but couldn't f find it thanks to some solid defending from Minnesota. And I really thought in the second half, as I said, not only Minnesota defended very well, but they didn't give up as much chances as they did in the first half where... Portland legitimately had some very decent chances in the first half to score, but they just couldn't take it. So the game remains tied at one apiece, and that, you know, Minnesota, again, in the second half, I thought they really show, showed some good counter-attacking counter skill against this Timbers team and really give this Timbers team a taste of their own medicine of the way that they play. And ultimately, in the 76th minute, after they, they've shown some good counter-attack, it was rewarded with a goal and that they they went back ahead in this game when Amaria who made his debut with Minnesota and coming into this game was relatively hot with the way that in the preseason he scored a ton of goals with this team well he would continue that streak into the regular season when he scored from Ethan Finley to give Minnesota a 2-1 lead and then two minutes later Molino basically closed the door door and make sure Minnesota was going to walk out with with a surprising three points against the Timbers at Providence Park when he scored from what? Once again, Finley to give Minnesota a 3-1 lead. And that was all she wrote in terms of this game. I mean, again, you know, as much as I was kind of surprising the fact that Minnesota was able to, to get a victory and able to get all three points against the, the Timbers. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of the fans fans there was very surprised with the fact that the Timbers was unable to get not only like three points in this game but they didn't even get a point out of this and that I don't re even remember the last time the Timbers have well actually I do remember the last time the Timbers lost in the season opener and that was last year against LAFC but that was different I mean LAFC last year we knew they were good and we knew that was always going to be a tough challenge but if you ignore what happened last year i don't remember the last time the timbers have actually lost a seasonal opener and you know they're you know this is just quite amazing of what minnesota did in this game and that if they can keep this up throughout the season this could be a very magical season for the loons and that this could really be a season where not only they can make the playoffs but they can really be an mls cup contender now in the sh terms of the shot department uh portland had 14 shots compared to 10 that minnesota has three shots on goal compared to four that the loons had seven shots off target compared to five that the loons had four shots that was blocked compared to one that the loons had and possession wise 58 percent possession compared to 42 percent possession that minnesota has and as for portland yeah this was not a good performance and that i know this is only the first week of the season but there's got to be some concern in terms of of this team because not only the fact that their finishing was pretty bad in this game, but their defense was pretty, pretty awful too. And especially in the second half, they just cannot deal with that counterattack that Minnesota put against them. And as a result of that, they they draw all three points in their season opener. And if you don't count last year when they dropped their season home opener against LAFC, 
I don't remember the last time they actually done it. It doesn't really happen very often for this team. But either way, hope you guys enjoy this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash that subscribe button. Uh, tomorrow I'll be doing the news of the week. And then on Thursday, I will be back doing the preview for for the Saturday and Sunday games that's going to be happening next week. And I believe there's going to be, once again, 13 games that's going to be happening throughout MLS. But, yeah, it's great that MLS is finally back. And this is going to be a normal routine that I'm going to be doing. Well, it won't be a normal routine with me doing this review on a Tuesday. But it will be a normal routine now. The fact that I'm going to be, once again, doing previews and reviews all the way up until the final game of the season and up to MLS Cup in November. But either way, hope you guys enjoy this video and I will see you guys next time.